Um, so we have to give this Creative Commons thing, uh, and then this is our standard picture here for the first module. Um, so this is really just an introduction to metabolomics. Now, all of you guys should have books, and you can follow along with your binders. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll mostly keep your laptops down. So part of this is just to get, a, an, I guess, give people an idea of, of what metabolomics is, uh, how big different metabolomes are, um, some of the applications. Again, people have already mentioned some really cool ones. Um, but also to talk about some of the technologies. And metabolomics is different than most other fields, including proteomics, and in particular transcriptomics or, or genomics, because there's a huge diversity of instrumentation. Many people will only learn or use one. Uh, we're trying to expand your horizons to realize, in fact, that um, the best metabolomics experiments and projects generally integrate at least two and usually three different technologies. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the differences between targeted and untargeted metabolomics, uh, something that you guys may have heard, a term like that before, and we'll try and distinguish them a little bit more. Michelle's already shown you this uh, schedule, so it's officially 9 o'clock right now, so uh, we'll have about an hour and a half to cover uh, this introduction uh, to metabolomics. So one way that I usually begin presentations about uh, metabolomics is this picture of a pyramid. Uh, I call it the pyramid of life. And it sort of shows this relationship between genomics and the genome, which is the base. So your DNA or plant DNA or microbial DNA is essentially what uh, codes for everything that comes up above that. Typically the genome is, is, is very large, humans 22, 23,000 genes, uh, 3, 3.1 billion bases. Genes code for proteins. Now people who do a bit of proteomics will argue in fact the proteome is not 22,000 proteins in humans, it's, it's 200,000, which is correct. Um, but what we're particularly interested in are, are enzymes, or isozymes, and these are the things that manipulate the enzymes. These are the, the workhorses in the cell, and there's about five or 6,000 of those in, say, human or mammalian cells. Those enzymes uh, manipulate the metabolome. And um, so you have this progression, as gene codes for protein, protein codes for metabolites, if you want study of each of them, genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. Part of the reason why there's that pyramid is that when you count the number of critical or endogenous metabolites that are typically shown on mo most biochemical pathways, there's about a thousand key ones. Humans have many more than that. Uh, most plants and animals have many more than that. But there's a thousand that are critical or essential. So 20,000, 5,000, 1,000, so we go up in numbers. Um, the other thing that uh, we also have to remember is that a small change in the genome often has a pretty profound effect at the metabolome. So it ripples up, uh, just like, you know, DDT, uh, which was sprayed in the 1960s. Insects took that in, but then it moved up the food chain and was starting to kill off owls and falcons and hawks. Um, so that's partly this, this impact of how the gene affects the metabolome. But there's also two other things I've shown here, which is the physiological influence and the environmental influence. So above, or at the top of the pyramid, um, is the environment. And the environment profoundly influences the metabolome. It mildly influences the proteome, but it barely touches the genome. If it did, uh, if the environment affected our genome, we'd all be mutants and zombies and things like that. So it just doesn't happen. Uh, genes are highly stable. Uh, things. Yes, there are epigenetic events. Yes, there are mutations. But they're rare. Uh, the metabolome, on the other hand, is, is um, changing profoundly. You guys have just eaten breakfast. It is changing uh, your body chemistry quite profoundly. Uh, what you're eating, breathing, uh, drinking, uh, what you're hearing is also changing your metabolome. Um, there's also an element, uh, what I call a physiological influence, and this has to do with the fact that uh, humans, plants, most organisms are not single cells. Uh, we're a collection of trillions of cells, and these assemble into organs. And in the case of humans, we have metabolically designed 
organs. Uh, we have liver, which performs very specific metabolic functions. We have a stomach that performs very specific metabolic functions. We have an intestine with its gut microflora that has very specific metabolic functions. We have parts of our body that consume only glucose, mainly our brain, other parts of our body that depend critically on, on, on fats. Um, and the metabolome and the metabolomes associated with the organs or the fluids that bathe those organs, so urine, saliva, cerebral spinal fluid, blood, all are quite different. However, if we were to look at our genes in each of these organs, they're all the same. Yes, there's maybe differences in gene expression, but they're all the same. So the metabolome uh, is, is profoundly influenced by physiology, by organ structures and or organ composition. And that's important to remember, especially when we're looking at, at uh, organisms that are multicellular and uh, as complex as plants and, and, and humans and other animals. So metabolomics, I don't think I have to give this definition, but it's you know, sort of the de facto thing that we have to talk about. So the relationship, and essentially metabolomics, grew from the term genomics. It was a, a wannabe thing. Um, so you can use exactly the same definition that we use for genomics. Um, it's a high throughput field of science. Technologies are used to characterize genes in cells, tissues, and organisms. Metabolomics, same words, and we've just replaced the word genes with small molecules or metabolites. Still has uh, a requirement for high throughput technologies, and it's still typically looking at multiple systems, tissues, individual cells if we want, or entire organisms. What we study in metabolomics is the metabolome, what we study in genomics is the genome, what we study in proteomics is the proteome. One of the biggest issues, I think, still today, uh, and I have respectable PhD scientists, professors coming up to me uh, asking if I can do or work on a metabolomics project with them, and then they list a whole bunch of proteins that we, they want me to measure. And that's because they don't know what a metabolite is. So technically, a metabolite is a small molecule. Usually it's organic. It doesn't have to be, uh, so I might be changing that. But most of the time it's organic. Um, and it's uh, typically the cutoff we use is about 1,500 Daltons. Some people will use 1,000 uh, Daltons. Um, we use 1,500 because there are a lot of lipids, actually, that are above 1,000 Daltons, like 1,100, 1,200 Daltons. So, the metabolites cover some very short peptides, five, six, seven, eight residues, oligonucleotides, two, three, four, sugars, carbohydrates, um, but also a lot of the other things that we think of as metabolites, so amino acids and ketones and aldehydes, steroids. But it also includes a lot of things that we eat or that other <coughs> animals eat, so that includes compositions of food, food additives. Uh, it includes toxins that we didn't intend to eat, pollutants that we didn't intend to inhale or drink. It also includes drugs. So there's both an exogenous and an endogenous metabolome. The endogenous is the one that would be the critical key metabolites, roughly about a thousand that are critical or essential. Um, and then a lot of other ones which are just around for, for kicks. Um, and then all these other things, which largely represent other metabolomes. So humans and other omnivores eat other metabolomes. Therefore, our metabolome uh, is rather complicated. It's also important to remember that we have uh, gut microflora. Most animals do. Even plants have gut, um, microflora uh, inhabiting them that are critical to uh, their function and, and existence. So there are endogenous human projects, products, and there are also endogenous microbial products. Um, for a metabolite to be a metabolite, it has to be detectable. Uh, it can be fictitious, and, and some of them sort of are. Um, but ultimately, we want to be able to show that it exists. It has to be, uh, in these days, the typical limit of concentration is maybe about 1 to 10 picomolar. So I've described this already, but you know the metabolome is both this collection of endogenous and exogenous molecules, covers all of the things that you'll find in tissues and cells, 
Um, it is defined by the technology. So if we can't see it to our end, it does not exist. Um, so because that's this complexity where it's, it's defined by detection technology, unlike, say, the genome, where we can read everything, and arguably even the proteome, where we can essentially now detect everything, there are many thousands of metabolites we believe are at this stage almost undetectable uh, because of our technology. Some of them undescribable, again, because of technology. And so that essentially means that metabolome, <coughs> unlike the genome and unlike the proteome, is always going to be ill-defined. <coughs> so lots of people ask me and may ask you, you know, how big are these metabolomes? Um, and this slide has changed every year I've given it. It'll change next year as well, um, just because of the fact we're dealing with an ill-defined set. So if we look at all mammals, uh, we can say right now that a detectable number of, of metabolites uh, is about 60,000 compounds. Um, that's give or take 10,000 or so. Uh, the human metabolome database has about 40,000 chemicals, but there's at least 20,000 that might include some exotic lipids, some undescribed food components, and things that we're still finding in the literature. Microbes are complicated, although any given species of microbes typically has about 2,000 different metabolites that it works with. Um, but there's lots of different species, and there are lots of different ecological niches. Um, so the estimate now is perhaps 100,000 chemicals, although I tend to think it's lower than that. Uh, plants are perhaps the most profoundly complex uh, uh, organisms in terms of their metabolomes. Estimates around 200 to 300,000 chemicals. So again, we see this gradation from the most complicated plants to the least complicated being mammals. And the reason why plants have so many more metabolites than mammals is plants don't move. So essentially for them to defend themselves, they can't run away from a threat, or in bacteria, swim away from a threat. So plants use chemical warfare. And that process has led them to essentially create the most complex metabolomes. That complexity also manifests in us in the sense that we eat plants. So we do take in a portion of their metabolome, and many of those 60,000 chemicals that I'm listing for, for mammalian metabolites are essentially plant-derived. So they're exogenous. So I mentioned that, that humans and uh, other omnivores, your dog or cat or whatever, um, will eat other metabolomes. And so this is a, a graph I've used many times to sort of illustrate this, this collection of different metabolomes. So there's maybe 30,000 endogenous metabolites. That includes microbial metabolites, things that our body produces. Many of them are lipids and lipid variants. Um, so as I say, bottom line, we need about 1,000 to live, but there's another 29,000 that are sort of there for the ride. Um, the concentrations range from picomolar to almost molar. So the most concentrated metabolite in your body is urea, which you find in urine. And that gets up to about two or 300 millimolar in some cases. Um, next layer up is uh, drugs. Um, we do take drugs, not all of us. Um, but there are about 1,400, 1,500 drugs known. Um, so these can, in a, in a given population, uh, show up. And some drugs are at relatively higher concentrations, um, sub-millimolar generally, um, but uh, they can also show up down to picomolar levels. Um, I've indicated in parentheses or brackets uh, some of the databases, which we'll talk about later on, that house this information. So in terms of endogenous metabolites, there's the human metabolome. In terms of drugs, um, there's a database called Drug Bank, which catalogs a lot of these. For the number of years, we've been working also on another one called the Food Database. And this represents the plant chemicals, food additives, and other things that, that we get exogenously 
And right now there's about 32,000 chemicals that we know of in the food database. And those are also about as equally concentrated as you might get in some drug doses. So they range from uh, tens or hundreds of micromolar down to picomolar. Drugs and foods uh, are metabolized. We do know, particularly in the case of drugs, there's lots of drug metabolites, and we've been cataloging those for a while. They're typically at least one-tenth to one-hundredth the concentration you'll find with drugs. Um, and then at this top uh, is essentially the toxins, environmental chemicals. Uh, hopefully those are at much, much lower concentrations than drugs or food or endogenous metabolites. If they aren't, then you're very sick. Um, so we try and keep them low through environmental protection laws and through limiting exposures, but they are there. And there's at least 3,000 that can be and have been detected. And a lot of that information is a database called the T3 database or the toxin, toxin target database. So these are the ones that we can detect, ones that have been described, people have measured them or described them in some way. We know their structures. But there's a lot of other metabolomes uh, that are, or components to that metabolome that we are pretty certain are there, but we just don't have the technology to either detect them or fully characterize them. So one example is lipids and lipidome. Um, there are a lot of exotic fatty acids that come from other uh, plants and animals. And so even though we might say there's about 30,000 lipids that are routinely detectable, describable, um, where we get structures, uh, it's probably larger than that, perhaps 100,000, 150,000. I'd mention there are maybe 2,600 drug metabolites. Those are the ones that we know about. But we also know enough about drug metabolism to know that each drug will produce anywhere between 5 and 10 metabolites. So if there's 1,400 drugs, you can do the math, it comes up to something between 10 and 15,000 drug metabolites probably exist. The food metabolome, this represents secondary food metabolites. Food that we eat gets transformed. Um, It'll become glucuronidated, it'll become sulfated, it'll be cleaved in different ways with hydrolases and esterases and other things. And so these are what we'll call secondary food metabolites. And so if there's, say, 30,000 food chemicals, we can expect anywhere from three to five different metabolites of each of those food chemicals. The other thing that we tend to forget is the fact that the endogenous metabolome that our body produces, those 1,000 or 5,000 key chemicals, also are treated uh, by our liver and by other organs as exotic. And so they'll also be transformed. They'll become glucuronidated. They'll become hydrolyzed and sulfated. Uh, so we'll call this the secondome. But this is, these are representing secondary endogenous metabolites that have been modified, methylated, hydroxylated, mostly by accident. Um, sometimes they're useful as signaling molecules. Um, but uh, just like we talk about junk DNA, there are junk metabolites, things that just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they get processed. And of course, they show up uh, in our spectrometers and instruments that detect them. So add these up, and we're talking about um, you know, several hundred thousand other metabolites. So 60,000 describable. The theoretical metabolome is probably closer to 200, 300,000 compounds, which gets into the realm of the size of the plant metabolome. Any questions about some of this? Am I coming off clearly, or are people losing my voice in the back? Okay. So the next thing is, uh, why? Why are we here? Uh, why are we wanting to learn about metabolomics? Uh, why do we think it's important? Um, I think it's useful to have some understanding of, of some general statistics, uh, at least as it might pertain to, to human health, which we're all concerned with. Um, so if you go to the doctor's office, if you've ever had any test, most of the tests that are done commonly, there are rare tests or expensive ones, but the common clinically diagnostic tests are all targeted for small molecules. So there's the cholesterol test, there's the blood glucose test, there's the blood gases test, um, there's the creatinine test to look for kidney function, and the list goes on and on and on. 
almost any of you who are younger than 25 have also probably had uh, a metabolomic test done on you. Uh, and these are essentially the newborn screening tests that have become mandatory in every province in Canada, every state in the US, and most countries in Europe. Um, so most diagnostic assays look for small molecules. The, the blockbuster drugs that everyone talks about, the, those antibodies that are being discovered, yes, they are useful, uh, but it's the same number for the last 40 years, same proportion. 90% of all drugs are small molecules. And most of those drugs actually are derived from metabolites. They're versions of compounds found either in plants or animals or microbes that we've modified, and we've made them into cool drugs. So we are inspired by nature, we are inspired by metabolites. So 90% of drugs are small molecules, half of which were derived from pre-existing metabolites, some of which already are metabolites. If you do a count on the number of genetic disorders that uh, people track, uh, particularly inborn errors of metabolism, which is probably the most frequently collected set of, of uh, genetic diseases, they account for something like I think one, one in six people has technically a genetic disorder of metabolism. And that could be anything from uh, lactose intolerance, which is fairly common in some populations, uh, to uh, hemochromatosis, which is iron buildup. And when you add them all up, some of them are one in ten, some are one in a hundred, some are one in a thousand. We come up to something like a one in six frequency of genetic metabolic disorders. We count the, so that makes them the most common. Uh, genetic disorder by far. Uh, but then when we tally all the different genetic disorders that we've classified, some of course might be cancer, some might be things that are related to physical disabilities, but about a third of them relate to small molecule metabolism. So again, it's a huge chunk of genetic diseases and the efforts that genetic uh, and genomic uh, projects uh, are currently undertaking. And the other thing that we tend to forget, especially if you're growing up around the world of genomics and proteomics, where everything's about proteins and protein networks, and everything's about genes and gene networks, most of these genes and most of these proteins would not function without small molecules. Almost every enzyme needs some metal cofactor or some um, heme-like group or some uh, vitamin cofactor to function. Um, and so these are absolutely critical for, for most of uh, biology. I mentioned this before, but it's still something I think to, to emphasize again, that metabolites function as the canaries of the genome. So you've heard of the term canaries in a coal mine. In the 1800s, miners would go down with little canaries uh, attached on the top of their helmets, and the canaries would be whistling all the time, and when the canaries stopped whistling, that was your signal to run, uh, because essentially the canary had died because of essentially a gas leak, usually methane or carbon monoxide. They were the more sensitive detector than your nose, um, and so um, in the case of metabolites, they're a more sensitive detector of what's going on. So a single base change can lead to a 10,000-fold change uh, in metabolite expressions. So that's one reason why the vast majority of clinical tests are small molecules tests. Things are conveniently amplified for us. So we don't have to do a whole genome sequencing to figure out what, what the problem is. We can just simply do a blood test and say, well, creatinine's too high, or glucose is too low, or whatever. But it's, again, because of that amplifying effect. I've also mentioned this time sensitivity with um, the metabolome. Uh, again, what you eat changes your metabolome uh, quickly and profoundly, many, many levels. Many metabolites, literally hundreds or thousands, rise and fall over the course of, of minutes or perhaps at most a few hours. Uh, if you eat something, yes, proteins do change. Levels of insulin, ghrelin, a couple of other ones will go up and down, but gradually. And then hopefully what you ate this morning isn't changing your genome. Um, so it is essentially intended to be something that is static and does not change. 
So I could show this picture with people eating, but I could also show the same picture with uh, a bacterial infection or a viral infection. Uh, typically, uh, if you are getting infected with something, your first response is not your white blood cells and not your um, um, other immune organs. It's essentially uh, it's a chemical response. And this has something to do with the fact that the ancient cells didn't have immune systems, but they did have ways of controlling uh, the flux of metabolites in and out of the cell. So this is the fast and quickest response that a cell can generally have. And this is one of the reasons why metabolomics is sort of hitting its stride in terms of biomarkers, because when a disease happens, often it's the metabolite that changes, or metabolite levels that change most rapidly. The other thing is that metabolism and metabolites, in addition to being you know, very useful for drug leads, very useful for uh, monitoring events, is that we actually do understand metabolism. Most of us probably wouldn't want to try and memorize this, but this is a wall chart that you can find in some of the older biochemistry labs, and it describes uh, metabolism, basically human metabolism, in, in exquisite detail. This chart is 40 years old. Um, and so we've known about metabolism and all the enzymes and all the processes and pathways for a long time. We're still adding to the chart, but the fact that 40 years ago we knew this much about metabolism is pretty remarkable. It's what you learn in biochemistry textbooks. Um, it certainly tells us that it is very well understood. It's very different than the sort of the, the network diagrams that you might get from Cytoscape or the hairball diagrams that are typically drawn in, in uh, network biology or systems biology. And, and I have a real pet peeve about hairball diagrams and, and network diagrams because they almost tell me nothing. They just tell me lots of things are connected. These have arrows. These have pathways. They have directionality. They have uh, um, beginnings and ends, products and reactants. Um, that's what we're actually aiming for in systems biology. That's what we should be trying to describe in terms of genes and protein interactions and pathways. So whether it's that pathway diagram that I've just shown or just some of the connections I've tried to point out is that metabolome is highly connected. It's, it, it impacts the genome, it impacts the proteome, uh, it impacts the transcriptome. And that connection is sort of seen in the fact that, first of all, all of these small molecules, AMP, GMP, CMP, TMP, they're the primary components of DNA. So without these small molecules, DNA doesn't exist. Without the small molecule 20 amino acids, proteins don't exist. Without lipids, cells don't exist. Without um, sugars and other, if you want, nutrients, cells don't stay alive. We don't stay alive. They are the energy source. And as I've already said, enzymes, at least two-thirds of enzymes, need cofactors. Those cofactors are small molecules, metals, vitamins. And these are the things that essentially help the genome and the proteome and the transcriptome work. So you can kind of turn it around and say that really the genome and the proteome evolved to help chemistry and that really metabolites just aren't there by accident. Um, they are the reason why we are alive, and we are simply vessels holding these uh, collection of chemicals, and the reason why we're not just bags of water is we essentially have a little bit more to do to make sure that those metabolites are put in the right place at the right time, so that we can think and eat and breathe and move. And it's kind of the way that I think people are also turning around the idea of the microbiome. Just saying that we're also vessels just to hold microflora, um, which is probably not too far from the truth either. So there is this connection, and we are sometimes brainwashed to think that in fact the molecules, small molecules, are just there for the for the ride, and everything revolves around genes and proteins. And I would really like people to think that it's actually the reverse, that uh, the genes and proteins are largely there for the ride and that it's metabolites that are doing all the things that allow you to think, breathe, and, and, and listen. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
So whether it's genomics, whether it's proteomics or metabolomics, um, making those connections, bringing those links together, and maybe raising the bar to what metabolism has already been able to do for, for biology and biochemistry, the idea of pathway diagrams of metabolic networks where things have a begin and an end, arrows, products and reactants, is a way of helping, I think, move the concept of systems biology forward. However, to make these things that right now are largely separate and distinct disciplines, we're having a metabolomics uh, session now, if you've been part of the CBW before, you've probably taken proteomics ones and you've taken genomics. We've never had a, things grouped together, but ultimately it's going to be through bioinformatics and it's going to be also through cheminformatics that these separate disciplines are, are, are brought together in, in the right way and that we think of, of biology more in a, in a systems biology perspective. So in terms of applications, uh, metabolomics is, is used pretty widely. We've heard a number of examples where people are using metabolomics in, in microflora work, in, in human biomarker studies, uh, in, in plant work, in, in uh, avian physiology. Um, it's pretty diverse, uh, but it's even more diverse than that. People are using metabolomics in toxicology quite a bit. Uh, food and beverage testing is actually critical. It's also quality assessment, uh, adulteration. Uh, people can identify a person's drug phenotype uh, by giving them standard cocktails of drugs and determining whether they're fast and slow metabolizers. There's a field of environmental metabolomics, which just simply because ponds and other things are places where living organisms live, uh, we can do a lot of things like water quality testing. Uh, in Alberta, where I am from, uh, one of the very first applications of if you want metabolomics I was ever aware of that started in the 1990s um, was to look at uh, oil. Oil is an organic product. It is the product of plants and animals growing and sort of getting cooked, but there's a lot of uh, really unique uh, organic material there. And it's been used for quite a number of years using NMR primarily, more recently FTMS, to distinguish uh, different uh, petrochemicals in different oils. We use metabolomics in things like genetic disease testing, uh, obviously in a lot of clinical analyses. Cholesterol testing and even lipoprotein testing is a branch of metabolomics. It's used in transplant monitoring and now there's imaging of uh, metabolites that's appearing both with NMR and also with mass spec. So lots of applications, some of which we're aware of, some of which you may not have been aware of. So I'm going to switch gears. I, I, you know, hopefully this has inspired you to say, oh, I want to learn and stick around for a little bit longer. Uh, but um, I'm going to switch gears and talk about the metabolomic methods. Um, and this is uh, partly an introduction. Again, I don't think everyone knows all of the methods. Some of you know the methods that I'll talk about very well, so you can kind of shut down. Others, for, for you, this will be maybe the first time you've heard about some of these techniques. Um, so the standard work for, for metabolomics is to start with typically a solid sample. It could be tissue, it could be plant, uh, it could be a cell pellet. Uh, and typically the, the next step is to liquefy that solid sample. Uh, we'll call it, uh, rather than uh, liquefying, we'll usually say it. we've extracted it or we've homogenized it. But the idea is to convert the solid to the liquid because chemistry works better in liquids. Most of the tools that we work with, like mass spectrometers and NMR, work with, with fluids. Sometimes we can save a step, uh, or a few steps, if we can collect the fluid right away. So in the case of humans, uh, we can collect blood or urine or saliva or cerebrospinal fluid. That's great. Uh, it's usually the preferred way to do metabolomics. Um, but um, Either way, it's trying to get to a starting point where we've got a fluid. Now, there's lots of issues with that fluid. Uh, most fluids are metabolically active, and this is where a lot of people forget, particularly the clinicians or field people that are collecting the samples. Uh, so it's important to freeze those samples so that all metabolism stops. If you have to work with the liquid sample briefly, make sure you're working with it cold. Uh, some uh, fluids are essentially metabolically sterile, so urine is generally sterile, so metabolically stable. Uh, 
Blood is absolutely not, and this is where we see some of the worst cases of, of uh, metabolic malpractice or metabolomic malpractice. Um, so uh, things have to be ex extracted or worked with fairly quickly. The next step is the chemical analysis, and in fact you could probably go to just about any standard chemistry lab or analytical lab and do metabolomics, at least collect the initial raw data. So you use HPLCs, you use MS, GCMS, you can use NMR. Um, where the real trick to metabolomics has been and is, is this last arrow, going from the spectrum to essentially a, a collection or a, of, of assigned or identified peaks and metabolites. And that identification process is, is, is what has revolutionized uh, metabolomics. Uh, everything else is standard. So without the tools, largely the software and the databases that are coming out or we'll, we'll talk about, um, metabolomics could not happen. So that's why we're having a course on, on informatics for metabolomics. So when we look at metabolomics, um, and this is a few years old, but it really hasn't changed much, there is a, a big difference in how complete our coverage is. So with high throughput next generation sequencing, it is routine to be able to sequence all the genes and genome to do RNA-seq and get all of the transcriptome. Um, and uh, if you aren't doing complete genome sequencing, people kind of look at you cockeyed because that's just, it's, it's so easy to do now. In the world of proteomics, a good proteomic experiment typically measures a few thousand proteins now. The coverage is at least, um, in the humans, at least five, and now reaching off and up to 10,000. Uh, complete proteome coverage in bacteria is fairly routine now. <coughs> when we do metabolomics, although some people will claim they're measuring 5,000 peaks or 10,000 features, in reality, uh, if you read all of the papers, uh, the typical maximum number of compounds that they identify is about 200. So there's this gradient, gradation, gradient in terms of, of what our coverage is. So metabolomics is only typically measuring about 1% of the metabolome, where genomics is measuring 99 or 100%, and proteomics is typically measuring about 20 to 30% of the entire proteome. So we're pretty bad still in the world of metabolomics in terms of having complete coverage. And it's probably one of the reasons why metabolomics is sort of the, the lapdog in the omics world. But it's also something that I don't think people in the world of genomics or proteomics appreciate, is that uh, metabolomics is extremely difficult because of the diversity of chemicals. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of chemically distinct species that have to be identified. In genomics, the reason why we're so successful for sequencing entire genomes is we just had to work out the chemistry for four types of molecules. And we've also been able to, because enzymology has also figured this out, so polymerases and synthetases are able to manipulate those things, because it's just four bases, pretty easily. And we exploit those enzymes to, to help with our sequencing. <coughs> Proteomics also is easy. It's just 20 amino acids. The chemistry for that was worked out by Fred Sanger in the 1950s, largely, at least for sequencing. And then we can adopt it for... for uh, proteomics by a mass spec, again, it's, it's easy. The, the math, uh, the informatics, and the chemistry are pretty easy. But when you're dealing with two or three hundred different, two hundred three thousand different chemicals, it's tough. And so in order to deal with that diversity uh, of, of chemical structure, we have to use a lot of different techniques. We use chromatographic methods, HPLC, UPLC, capillary electrophoresis. We combine these with mass spectrometry, and we use different mass spectrometers for different situations. We use NMR spectroscopy. We'll use gas chromatography for volatile things. We'll use infrared spectroscopy to help with stuff. And 
And when we're really, really desperate, we'll even use crystallography to figure out the structures of the molecules that we've, we've isolated. So we could talk about every one of these. We're not going to have enough time. So I'm going to talk about some of these uh, in, in broad, sort of sweeping strokes. Some of this, again, if you've had a bit of a background in analytical chemistry, you can shut down, uh, read your Facebook page or whatever. Uh, for some of you who are uh, relatively new to this, uh, hopefully you'll kind of tune in. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is chromatography, uh, because it is integral to so much of metabolomics. Uh, and typically, uh, you might have had your very first experience in chromatography in high school. Usually you'll do a little bit of it uh, in an organic chemistry lab with thin layer chromatography. But basically it's a matter of separating components. And you have what is called a mobile phase and you have a stationary phase. The stationary phase represents like silica, it might represent plastic beads or, or derivatized beads, something that looks like sand to your eyes. Um, and the mobile phase is usually some fluid. And it might be something that you've dissolved your, your mixture in, or it might be something like blood or urine um, or a plant extract. So there's many types of chromatography. Uh, probably everyone at some point has had to do thin layer chromatography if you did a university chemistry course. Uh, if you've ever had to purify proteins, you've probably done column chromatography. Um, if you've ever had to work with uh, smaller molecules and spend some time in an analytical chemistry lab in second or third year uh, university, you may have done gas chromatography. Uh, you can do a variety of forms. Some of these are reverse phase, normal phase. Some can be gravitational uh, pressure. Others are simply high pressure. All of these techniques are used and can be used to, to help with the separation process. And what's chosen depends on the chemical that you're looking at, the, the, the extract that you're also working with, how much money you have, and how much time you can afford. The most common method for separating compounds, small molecules, uh, or metabolites, um, is high pressure or high performance liquid chromatography. So we'll just call it HPLC. That's been around for 40 years. Uh, and the essence is to use uh, not atmospheric pressure, which is <coughs> gravity feed chromatography, but to pump things up to um, almost a thousand times more than atmospheric pressure, uh, about 6,000 pounds per square inch, uh, and to work with tiny pressure stabilized beads, which to our eyes look a lot like sand. And with HPLC we're able to uh, not only separate things, but when it's coupled with um, suitable detection uh, systems we can detect things down to the parts per trillion level, which is pretty impressive. Depending on the particles or beads that you're using in HPLC, you can separate both polar and nonpolar compounds. And usually you'll try and use different columns for polar and different columns for nonpolar uh, molecules. So there are three major uh, types of, of phases that are the solid or uh, immobilized phase the, uh, or stationary phase. So the reverse phase is probably the most common. Uh, this is when we say a C4 or a C18 or a C12 column. That's a reverse phase column. Um, and usually uh, in that case the column is very hydrophobic. Uh, the mobile phase, the fluid that's pumped through the column, is usually quite polar. It's water, or acetic acid, acetonitrile, some kind of mixture. Normal phase is actually the very first form of HPLC done. Uh, it's rarely done anymore, although um, you can use it for, for lipid separations particularly. Um, the normal phase, the, the, the stationary matrix is relatively polar. And the mobile phase is relatively nonpolar, which again makes it useful for, for lipids. So it could be I don't know, kind of chloroform or methanol or something like that. One that's picking up a lot in popularity is uh, helic or hylic, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And that stands for hydrophobic interaction liquid chromatography. And the reason why it's so popular is it separates the polar molecules. <coughs> And it turns out the vast majority of compounds that you find in urine, cerebral spinal fluid, plant extracts, are polar. 
And those are the things that are most detectable. And in fact, because plants and animals live in an aqueous environment, that's the way most metabolites are. Um, so in this case, um, the stationary phase is usually a polar matrix. And the mobile phase, the, the solvent that you pump through, is kind of a mixed polar, nonpolar phase. So again, water methanol, water ethanol, something like that. HPLC columns have to take a lot of pressure, so usually they're made out of something that's a little stronger. Uh, you can have HPLC columns out of glass, but I haven't seen one. Uh, almost all the ones I have seen in my life are, are stainless steel. Uh, they're usually relatively narrow, um, and there are two types in HPLC. We can have preparative HPLC, and we can have analytical HPLC. Almost everything that you would do in metabolomics labs would be analytical HPLC. Um, if you're someone who is a natural products chemist, you might have some preparative HPLC systems. Preparative ones have broader columns. Um, so the columns are, are measured in anywhere from 2 to 50 centimeters, and, and they'll have a diameters ranging from 1 to uh, 50 millimeters, most being more like 5 to 10 millimeters. So the columns themselves are usually purchase them, although some people actually try and pack their own. Has anyone ever tried to pack their own HPLC column? Just Michelle. It dates you then. <laughs> um, but uh, these days everyone buys them. And um, what you'll see here are uh, the beads. So these are the things that are 5 microns across. Uh, very tiny, pressure sensitive, but they are somewhat porous. So they have to be porous, but they can't compress because you're applying 6,000 PSI. So the best way to make something porous is to make it sort of out of silica. Um, so it's almost like clay, if you want, or, or baked uh, ceramic. But what we do is we derivatize these uh, ceramic beads or silica beads with something hydrophobic. And in this case, we're attaching uh, an 18 chain um, carbon. Uh, moiety or a lot of them on the surface. So it makes a greasy uh, glass bead. It's basically what you've done. Uh, and then you pack these greasy uh, glass or, or clay beads into the column and you now have your stationary phase. Now you can play around with this. You can have something that's very hydrophobic like C18 or less hydrophobic like a 4-carbon butane attached to it. You can also change it so it's not an aliphatic, but you can change it so that you're sticking aromatic molecules, like uh, biphenyl molecules. Or you could even stick on these polar moieties, um, so nitrile groups can be stuck on. And so that becomes a, a polar stationary phase. So people can play around with the chemistry, and the idea is the, the surface you're surrounding the bead with is, is to make it into a somewhat chemoselective, if you want. Like dissolves like. So molecules that have C18 groups on them, like lipids, uh, would probably like to stick onto this bead. Whereas, uh, I don't know, uh, caffeine, which is a very polar molecule, would not like to stick onto this C18 bead, and it would come out in the void volume very quickly. So we can play around not only with the beads and what we stick on them, but we can also play around with the column, uh, how long it is, uh, and also with the size of the beads. So long columns give you much better separation. So we're seeing a 50 millimeter column and a 100 millimeter column. So if you want good separation, long columns are great. Problem is it's usually this issue of time. It also takes longer to separate on a long column. So your boss may not give you that much time, so then you're stuck with a 50 millimeter column. So if you're stuck with a 50 millimeter column, you can improve things um, by getting smaller beads. And small beads are actually uh, the basis to UPLC, or ultra-high performance liquid chromatography. Um, and now they're getting beads that are roughly one micron in size. Uh, so you can still have the same column length um, and still have very short times, 10-minute um, separations, but get essentially the equivalent separation as you would on a 100-millimeter column using 5 microns. So that's the basis to UPLC, which some of you have heard. So 
yeah, both, both. So if you want really, really good separation, really tiny beads, really, really <coughs> long columns, uh, it does. Um, so typically, most HPLC systems are set up. There's many different vendors that produce them. Um, usually you have a solvent, so this is your mobile phase. There's usually different recipes. Um, and you'll have a pump that delivers the, the solvent at that high pressure. You'll inject the sample um, while the column is being pumped through. So the sample joins in. And then it gets pushed through the, the HPLC column under this high pressure. And then you'll detect it. And the detection systems can be anything. They can be ultraviolet uh, absorbents. They can be fluorescence, which is incredibly sensitive. They can be evaporative light scattering, uh, ELSD. Um, some people will even connect them straight to a mass spec without any kind of um, uh, visible detector. So the detector can be any one of four or five different things. And then as you're detecting, uh, you're tracking and producing what's called a chromatogram. Um, and um, then collecting the material in, in could be waste, or you could be saving the material in, in a fraction collector for future measurement. So this is the essence of a simple HPLC. Most HPLC is not done with a single solvent, but it's done using a gradient. So you're actually making, you have two, some cases even three, solvent mixtures that are uh, programmatically stirred and introduced over a half hour or however long you're running your experiment. And this allows you to play not only with, well, essentially how to modify um, both the, the solution and the interaction of the solute with the column, uh, so you get preferential uh, retention. So gradient HPLC uh, allows you to greatly improve the separation of, of many, um, many mixtures. And it, it's a recipe that is done where there's, there's no absolute. Uh, it, people will play around with different solvents, different mixi mixing regimes. Uh, it's more of an art than a science. Uh, but if you've got someone who's good at this, uh, they're like gold in a lab. Um, they'll work out some protocol and you can get sp spectacular separations, whereas before you just saw one big lump. So gradient HPLC is, is the other trick beyond playing around with columns and column packing and column material. Um, and so it gives you lots of options. So the end result of HPLC, liquid chromatography, with solvents like water and methanol and acetonitrile and acetic acid, uh, gives you this. This is a chromatogram. So this is one that was run for about an hour, 50 minutes. And you can see, as measured by absorbance units or milliabsorbance units, so this means we are monitoring by UV, a bunch of compounds came out. Typically, each peak um, may correspond to one to up to a dozen different compounds. Uh, the intensity is an indication of how much material is there. Because we're using absorbance, there are some things that do not have or do not absorb. And so, in fact, they may also show up but they're not detectable using your detector. Um, so these are things to consider, uh, and they're important when you're doing isolations and separations. So we can separate in liquid, but we can also separate by gas. And one of the oldest analytical techniques around is called gas chromatography. In this case, um, we are working not with solvents, but with uh, vapors or gases. <coughs> and we're separating still in columns. But the process with gas chromatography, and maybe I should, how many people have done gas chromatography? Just raising your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So most of you, or half of you, are at least familiar with this. But the point about it is that it's ideally suited, or it was originally developed, for volatile compounds things that are already easily evaporated, things that you can smell. Um, but it, it can also be adopted to making things that are not terribly volatile, like vitamins and lipids and other things, amino acids, um, by chemically modifying them so that they can be volatile. So 
if you can get either something that is volatile, smelly, or something that can be volatilized, then you create it, vaporize it into a gas, and then you put it into a column. Column is a little different than an HPLC column. Um, and rather than pushing a solvent, you have a carrier gas, usually something like helium, that pushes um, the vaporized material through the column. Material interacts with the column interface. Some of it will stick, some of it won't stick, and so things will start separating. So the mobile phase is gas, the stationary phase is some kind of polymer uh, that's absorbed to the surface of the column. Columns aren't very uh, wide, they're usually a couple millimeters at most, uh, internal diameters, so very thin. They're very, very long, uh, usually 10, even 20 meters. So not like HPLC columns, which are 50 or 100 millimeters. These things are 100 times longer. Um, obviously, if they were stretched out as straight columns, they wouldn't fit in most labs, so they're coiled very tightly. Um, and uh, they're put in an oven, so as to keep things in the gas phase. If the stuff isn't smelly and easily volatilized, you der derivatize it with a trimethyl silane, or TMS. And this is how TMS derivatization is, is done. You can take an organic molecule, in this case an, an amino sugar, um, which is not very volatile. It would be a, basically a solid. Um, but if you hit it first with uh, methanol uh, hydrochloric acid for a while, you can uh, modify it. Uh, and essentially, once it's been modified in this way, then it's more susceptible to being uh, silated or uh, trimethyl silated. So this uh, trimethyl silo group actually makes many compounds uh, gassy or gaseous or easily volatilized. Heating them up to maybe uh, 75 to 100 degrees, it'll just easily go into, uh, into a gas. Whereas if you didn't, you'd have to essentially, well, you've probably tried to cook sugar, uh, and if you cook it too long, it just turns to charcoal. So uh, not the best for, for being volatilized. So like liquid chromatography, the sample is introduced, but instead of using liquid, you use helium gas, and you push the volatile sample down through the column. And so things that stick to the column uh, move slowly. Things that don't stick to the column move quickly and come out. And so just like the liquid chromatogram that we saw, you will get a gas chromatogram where there are peaks. And you can measure things using absorbance or fluorescence, but usually flame ionization detection or mass spectrometry. So the intensity of the peak is an indication of how much is there. As I say, the columns themselves are long and narrow. They look like wires, uh, electrician's wires if you want, coiled up. Inside they're hollow, and they usually have essentially a silica um, or fused silica interior that then is uh, derivatized with um, a stationary phase, and many of them are polysiloxane. So these are things that are uh, a mix of uh, silicon molecules polymerized to have either benzene or methyl or a combination of those groups. So they're fairly hydrophobic. And this mix of, of aromatic, aliphatic, um, essentially allows different compounds to stick with different affinity, therefore to separate. You can play around with what you derivatize the column with. Um, and that too, just like with HPLC, with normal or helic or reverse phase, um, gives you a different separation efficiencies for different types of compounds. So you'll notice that in chromatography, things take time. We were talking about measurements of minutes, uh, 50 minutes for HPLC. Um, in, in GC, same sort of thing. Separations typically on 30, 40, 50 minutes. So we talk about retention times. And so some things are retained, some things aren't. That retention time is, is affected by um, how fast you're pushing the helium gas. It can depend on the pressure, depend on the temperature of the oven, um, how much you've put in, uh, all of those things. What's particularly 
useful in gas chromatography, and the reason why it's still done today is the retention times can be converted to retention indices, which are surprisingly consistent from column to column, lab to lab, uh, city to city, country to country. It's not the same with liquid chromatography. So by normalizing to a standard set of, of uh, alkanes that you can standardly buy and inject, uh, you can make your retention times or retention indices consistent with everyone else around the world. And so there are tables of thousands of retention indices or retention times for thousands of compounds. And simply matching a retention index to some of these in these tables, you can have a pretty good idea of what your compound is. So you don't have to do any detection, you don't have to do any mass spec characterization, and just simply saying, ah, this is a compound, this is its retention index, I'm pretty certain it would have to be this compound. Now that's not ideal, but you can't do it with liquid chromatography. Columns vary too much. Packing differs from vendor to vendor. Column widths vary too much. Solvent, solvent pressures vary too much. It's just too hard to be consistent from lab to lab. So there is no universal table with retention times for HPLC. So this is an example, of sort of zooming in, but this is a you know a GC uh, chromatogram. You can see one sample here. Uh, we can identify based on its retention time, uh, and we may have maybe characterized or put an authentic sample, so we know that this this compound is acrylamide. Uh, then we could do another run again from a different biological sample, say, and then we see there's more acrylamide, but we see that it essentially comes off almost identical or identical retention time or retention index. That's this re reproducibility of GC which is so useful. And if we've got a sensitive detector, measuring the area under the curve is, allows us to actually quantify. So if we produced a standard that we ran first where we knew exactly how much there was in this sample B, then we could use the information from sample A to actually quantify things. So calibrating with standards means that GC is, is quite quantitative. So this is, again, a picture of a GC chromatogram. Uh, you can see that peaks are probably narrower than what you'll see with HPLC. Um, and what's the numbers, essentially, I've identified the compounds. In many cases, the compounds were identified by mass spec, but in other cases, just by looking at the retention time and retention indices, they also could be uh, identified. And the nice thing about GC is you could run this, that's the chromatogram you get this morning, you could run it tonight, you get the same one, you could run it two months from now, almost the same one. Highly reproducible as long as the column is well cared for. Any questions about chromatography? Okay, so we're going to talk about the analytical methods that are typically attached to uh, chromatography. Um, and uh, so you separate a compound, now you need to, to characterize it. The most common method uh, is mass spectrometry. And I think it, uh, probably everyone here that's doing metabolomics probably uses mass spec. So it's a method for weighing samples. Um, there's all kinds of different mass spectrometers. This is an older one, a time of flight instrument. But they're usually the size of uh, a refrigerator, either laid on its side or standing up. Uh, and they usually have uh, computer equipment attached to them. Really what you're doing in mass spectrometry is you're identifying compounds by their molecular weight. Every compound has a fairly unique molecular weight, just like everyone in this room probably weighs slightly differently. So. If I can't remember your names, if I had a table of your weights and your names, I could just, so just sort of ask, what's your weight? Now I know your name. We're doing the same thing in mass spectrometry. We have, and we can calculate the weight of any molecule if we know its formula. Um, obviously there are uh, isobaric systems or compounds that weigh identically. Isoleucine, leucine are isomers and they weigh identically. Mass spec can't really tell us what they are unless we do something special. Um, but that's the, that's the essential point about mass spectrometry. Measure something, weigh it, 
you can probably figure out what it is. With the best mass spectrometers, we can measure uh, molecular weights or atomic weights um, down to one part per million. And that's sufficiently accurate now to determine uh, not only its weight, but to calculate its uh, molecular formula. And that's pretty cool. Uh, just being able to say, if this is its uh, molecular weight, this is how many carbons it must have, this is how many hydrogens it must have, this is how many sulfurs, nitrogens, and so on. For peptides and proteins, uh, with that mass accuracy, it means we can generally determine the molecular weight of a protein to within one Dalton, uh, which is pretty good. So what we usually do is we attach mass specs to other instruments. So we'll attach gas chromatographic equipment to a mass spec. We'll attach HPLCs and UPLCs to a mass spec, so that becomes LCMS. Or we can attach a mass spec to a mass spec, uh, and that becomes tandem mass spec. And mass spectrometry also separates molecules. So we have one that sort of separates, and then one that sort of then analyzes or weighs um, the molecules. So these are different types of forms of mass spectrometry that we'll use and, and are commonly used in metabolomics. A good metabolomics study probably would use all three of these. So with the instruments of today, the modern ones, uh, we measure uh, what's typically called the monoisotopic mass. So that's the mass of um, the compound, the molecular weight, <coughs> using the most abundant isotopes. If you have a low resolution mass spectrometer, uh, like a triple quad or a Q-trap, uh, you'll tend to measure the average mass. And that's essentially the mass of all of the isotopic components. So what you're seeing here is some heavy molecule uh, with a, maybe it's a lipid or something, but 1155.6 Daltons. That's the monoisotopic mass, that's the tallest peak. Roughly in steps of one Dalton to the right are the different isotopomers. Um, and these represent things that may have deuterium or carbon-13 or something like that, or combinations of them. They're less abundant because um, deuterium and carbon-13 are rarer. What's marked in red is essentially the weighted sum of those isotopomers, and that gives you an average mass of 1156.3. So if you had a low uh, mass or a low resolution mass spectrometer, you'd get um, an average weight of 1156. This just illustrates that um, chlorobenzene, where we have um, a list of the isotopic distributions, hydrogen, deuterium, carbon-12, carbon-13, in this case chlorine, chlorine-35 and chlorine-37. Carbon-13 and deuterium are fairly rare, but chlorine-37 actually is very common, about a third of all chlorine atoms are there. So based on the abundance of these hydrogen, carbon, and chlorine, we can actually figure out what our isotopic abundance would be. So if we had all of the lowest molecular weight, just proton, just carbon-12, just chlorine-35, the mass of this molecule is 112.007. We could also get two other versions, uh, one Dalton more, where either there's a single deuterium uh, or a single um, <coughs> carbon-13 in the molecule. Then you could imagine that we could also have two carbon-13s and two deuteriums. And so in that case, the molecular weight is two Daltons more. Or we could have a chlorine-37 which also boosts the molecular weight by Dalton, two Daltons. But because chlorine-37 is so much more abundant, we'll actually see a much more intense peak. Um, so this is actually the isotopomer uh, pattern that you actually see for chlorobenzene. So instead of this rapid tailing off that we saw here, which is more common, uh, you see this peculiar shift where you have what's marked as the intensities. But if you have a high-resolution mass spectrometer, you normally see multiple peaks for a single compound. And that's because you're seeing these isotopomers um, being detected in these very high-resolution instruments. All mass specs are constructed in this three-step 
structure. They all have some kind of ionizer, they all have some kind of mass analyzer or mass separating device, and they all have a detector. They all produce very sharp uh, or finely described peaks where what's shown at the bottom is the mass to charge or m over z ratio, and then the intensity which is measured by the frequency of these hits. So here's this is a, an EIMS spectrum, so you're seeing the fragments of, of a compound. Yeah. No. So the primary ion would be typically, I think maybe it's the one around 180 in this case. Uh, and then, yes, you're seeing fragments from electron ionization. Um, so the fragmentation of, of aspirin. But again, just the point that's a little different than a chromatogram in that uh, we're measuring not time but mass to charge. We do see intensities, we see multiple peaks. So it looks a little bit like a chromatogram. We can measure um, mass spectra. I mean most of them have these narrow peaks. As I said, there's this height. Some ions fly, some don't. So this is one of the challenges of mass spectrometry. Um, not everything is detectable, not everything um, flies from the matrix. As a result, the intensity of the peaks don't really indicate the quantity. Whereas with HPLC or GCM, uh, that's usually the intensity of the peak is a good measure of, of quantity. We can measure the quality of a mass spec or the quality of the spectra by resolution or resolving power. Just like when we look in optics, can you resolve something in focus or out of focus? Uh, so we use the same optics term called resolve power or resolution. So delta M is the width of the mass, um, the two mass differences that we, we, we can separate or distinguish, um, and then mass is the observed mass of the molecule that we're looking at. So most people use this 50% uh, cutoff, 50% uh, height, and it's the same thing that's typically used in optics, but if you have two peaks that are close together, two dots um, uh, on a page, uh, how close can you move the dots before they seem to merge into one? Same sort of thing with mass spec, how close can you move the two mass peaks before they seem to be just one big lump? Uh, so that's a way of measuring resolution, and so you can see here in a real example, this is a, a lower resolution mass spectrometer, an ion trap, uh, where the resolution here is defined as 700. And then you have a higher resolution time of flight mass spectrometer, and what you're able to see is actually all of the isotopomer peaks. Um, so the resolution in the lower one is almost 10 times greater. Yes? Next question. Um, we're assuming that the, once we have our separation, we have an individual compound, but we're talking about complex mixtures. How can we be certain that that is an individual molecule? Uh, you can't generally, and in fact, this is one of the, the challenges. Um, the um, uh, you will often have many situations where there's multiple um, masses sort of overlapping, um, and so that's the challenge of both separation and then the spectral deconvolution. So we'll be talking a little bit about that tomorrow. Another question. No, in terms of quantification, uh, particularly in terms of absolute quantification, it really doesn't matter too much. Um, usually you're going to be using a, an isotopic standard to help with the quantification, so you have an authentic standard, um, and you're looking at relative peak areas, um, and by the time you're quantifying you know exactly which peak you're looking at, what time it's coming off on the chromatogram. So most of that has been sort of worked out. So this is another example just illustrating a range of resolution going from, in this case, 1,000 to 30,000, which you might get in, say, an FTMS instrument. So we're going to blue, to red, to green, to black, and you can see that the blue level looks like one big lump, and by the time you're looking at the black peaks, uh, every single peak is clear and sharp, easily differentiated. So a real difference when you're working with high-resolution mass specs, and there's a lot of information there that we'll, we'll learn about a little later.
So different kinds of ways of ionizing. So remember there's the ionizer, the mass analyzer, and the detector. So there's different ionization techniques that are used. One is called the electron ionization. This is characteristic of, of gas chromatography. It's generally done for small molecules. It's actually a great way of determining the structures of compounds. So if you're working with unknowns, it is possible to actually figure out the structure, or at least partly the structure. There's also chemical ionization methods, CI. That's also used in gas chromatography uh, frequently. Uh, it doesn't fragment things quite as badly uh, as electron impact. Then there's ESI and MALDI. These are two soft ionization techniques originally developed for proteomics and proteins, but they can be and are frequently used in metabolomics. Um, so they don't fragment the molecules quite as badly. Uh, often the parent ion is still detectable. Um, and this is a technique usually where we're just seeing, in some cases, just a single peak, uh, just the parent ion, and that's how some of us identify uh, particular metabolites. This is just a picture of electron ionization, um, and we can see that um, this is very similar to the GCMS instruments. So you have a standard uh, uh, electrode, 70 volts, uh, that's being applied. You s put in your um, uh, normally neutral molecules, but electrons then fly off from these electrodes um, and impact the, the neutral molecules and ionize them. Once they're ionized, then they can be characterized by mass spec, because we're always measuring charged molecules in mass spectrometry. So EI ionizes by hitting things with an electron beam. Is that gas at that point? Yeah, typically what's submitted at this time, everything is volatilized. So the, the key thing in, in mass spectroscopy uh, or spectrometry is everything has to be sort of volatilized, nebulized, vaporized in some way uh, so that, that uh, things can um, be further ionized so or can be... Yes, usually it's a pretty low vacuum. High, it's, high, very low, or just... Um, not really low for GCMS. Uh, for some of the LCMS systems, which we don't usually use for EI, it's, it's somewhat much lower, you know, micro tor, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. So uh, EI is used for gas chromatography MS. Um, we bombard things using, it could be just the equivalent of a tungsten filament, not unlike what you see with a, a light bulb, an incandescent light bulb, but it's at a set energy. It's always 70 volts or 70 electron volts. Electrons moving at, at uh, 70 electron volts will shatter bonds, which are held together at 5 electron volts. So you break up the molecule. And so the fragmentation is sometimes pretty severe. In the case of something like methanol, you can fragment it into two or three or four different molecules or fragments. Um, you're knocking off the hydroxyl group, you're knocking off the hydrogen, you're knocking off or changing things to double bonds. Very bizarre looking molecules that are very uh, metastable or stable for very short periods of time. But they are all ionized. They all have, in this case, a positive charge. And when they are sent through the mass spec, they fly through the electrodes and they will be detected by the detector and you will see masses. So the CH3OH parent ion, 32 Daltons, the CH3 uh, methylene group, 15 Daltons, you'll see that. So you're seeing these different peaks. The intensity partly reflects the level of ionization, relative abundance, partly how well they fly. Uh, it's not, as I say, the best way of, of measuring quantity, uh, but at least in EI, um, molecules break up in predictable ways. And because it's so standardized, there are tables and databases of thousands of compounds with standard spectra. So you can compare an EI spectrum and identify a compound by just looking at that sort of fingerprint. Soft ionization methods are different. Uh, MALDI, you put a substance on a sort of a photo-absorbing ma uh, matrix, you'll hit it with a laser. Uh, that absorbs heat, things sort of blow off, and you ionize what was deposited on the matrix. Or in the case of electrospray ionization, you'll put things through sort of like a, an aerosol spray can or equivalent, 
uh, there's a high voltage at the end of the aerosol tip, and this causes things to further vaporize uh, in a low vacuum environment, uh, low pressure vacuum environment, and, and the vapor uh, turns very much into a gas. This is sort of shown in detail here, where you'll have sort of a fluid that's pushing past the, or through a capillary, and then you'll have a gas that surrounds the fluid, um, and a, a very strong um, electrode, uh, thousands of electron volts, uh, that essentially just causes um, this to work like a, an aerosol spray can. Um, so you get fine particles of fine mist spraying out, and then as the mist goes into the vacuum, uh, the particles, which are at this stage tiny liquid drops, start evaporating. Uh, they contain charges because you've put, applied a fairly high um, voltage at the tip of the electrospray device. And as they evaporate, they essentially shrink down to just carrying a couple or one ion. Um, and of course then they'll fly through the electrodes in the mass spec, um, and then it ultimately be detected. Different compounds will have different charges, and some of them will be multiply charged. Uh, charged. Yeah, yeah. So it sort of depends on, on luck and happenstance of which ones are going to be singly charged or doubly charged or triply charged. Um, ESI is something that's typically used with uh, substances that have no salts. So you can't put urine into an ESI straight away because there's lots of salts. You don't want to have detergents in them. But if the thing's fairly clean uh, and it's been processed usually through or cleaned up through an HPLC, then you can pump them through these capillary uh, tubes at a few microliters a minute. You apply this really strong voltage and then you aer create this aerosol. And the aerosol, if you've ever you know, put your hand against a spray can, uh, you know, with off or something like that, like some kind of insecticide, yes it's liquid, but if you put that aerosol spray can in a vacuum, those droplets will rapidly evaporate and then you essentially get these um, essentially ions, gas ions, uh, that are essentially atomic size. Of course they still carry charges. You can play around not only with the, the voltage, the size of the capillary, the sheath gas, the flow, but you can also play around with the, the solvent. So depending on how much water or acetonitrile or other volatile uh, solvents you add, you can change the point at which uh, ionization begins. So if you have more of a uh, hydrophobic solvent, um, the ionization will happen at a lower voltage. You can make it now nano spray devices where they're looking at less than a microliter per minute. Um, it's extremely sensitive. Uh, as I'd mentioned, this issue of salts and detergents, so you, you have to do quite a bit of cleanup for ESI to work. And then you have to switch between two different modes often positive mode and negative mode. Some molecules ionize better under the positive mode, some molecules ionize better in the negative mode. It depends somewhat on the structure of the compound. So these are the ionization methods. Then you can do ana uh, analysis uh, where you'll have this is where the terminology in mass spec. So almost none of you probably would have heard of the magnetic sector analyzers, but these are the original mass specs from the 1900s. Still occasionally you'll find a few of them, but they use big magnetic fields to separate things. Now everything do is done through electric fields typically, although in the case of ion, FTS, FTMS, they also use magnets, huge magnets. Um, so they're quadrupole analyzers. These have lower resolution, one atomic mass unit. Then there's the time of flight, which have higher resolution of, you know, 5,000, 10,000. And then the FTMS instruments, which are the most expensive and generally have the highest uh, resolution available. So we talk about resolution. We can also talk about mass accuracy, and they kind of go hand in hand. And this is just this table of, 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 of the accuracy. So you can see that FTMS and Orby traps give you your best mass accuracy. So we can talk about mass accuracy or precision around 1 ppm. Uh, no one has magnetic sector ones, but they're pretty accurate. And then there's the time of flight mass specs. So somewhere between 3 and 5 ppm is typical. 
Uh, some triple quads can get down to 5 ppm, but you have to operate them in a different mode. And then most of the ion traps around 100 ppm, so lower resolution. Um, so when we collect a mass spectrum, we actually can collect them different ways or display them in different ways. Um, we're measuring, this is in the, we have a detector, we're seeing things coming off, in this case mostly electrospray, so there's, there's a time uh, chromatogram element to this. If, if we have an LC and it's pushing off and we don't put a UV detector but we put a mass detector, then we're essentially detecting masses, not UV absorbance. And so we are measuring masses um, over time. And so we can see what are called total ion chromatograms, that's the red one, which is just sum of all intensities across the entire range. The one that is generally preferred is sort of the base peak chromatogram. Um, so it's mostly displaying the most intense peaks. And then there's the extracted ion chromatogram, uh, where you might just have one or two ions that are extracted from the, the full set. So this is what we would see in terms of a chromatogram. So we've seen an LC chromatogram, we've seen a GC chromatogram, here is an MS chromatogram, uh, where we're seeing time, and in this case we're seeing masses um, for specific compounds. Uh, so the masses correspond to a compound. So we're just using mass spec instead of UV or fluorescence as our detector and we're running over time because we're using, in this case, LC. So I've only got about five minutes here, and what I, if people are okay, because we kind of were a bit delayed um, with the break, uh, if I could run on for another f five minutes beyond, so about 10.35, people aren't going to die. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk about sort of the last part here, which is just NMR. Um, so this is another technique, and I don't know how many people have ever used NMR in their metabolomics. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, which is kind of the normal <laughs> breakdown. Um, so it's not the most popular method for metabolomics, but we're going to try and convince you that it's a really useful method. So NMR also produces chromatograms, uh, uses big magnets, uh, and we detect um, spectroscopic um, features. We use strong magnets. We'll work with liquid samples under an intense magnetic field of, of tens of, of, of Tesla uh, or hundreds of thousands of Gauss. And what we do is we send radio waves into the sample under this strong magnetic field and then we look to see what, where those radio waves or radio frequencies are absorbed. So it's a little bit like UV absorption where we measure what's absorbed and just like the different colors are absorbed. So in radio frequency there's different colors of radio frequency. So some compounds absorb at high frequency, some absorb at low. The unique feature is that it's not a single peak for a single compound. It's usually many peaks for a single compound, and that's the special strength of NMR. It allows you to uniquely identify many compounds <coughs> that way. So NMR measures nuclear magnetism. It's not electromagnetism, it measures the magnetism in the, in the nucleus. It's not working with uh, ultraviolet light, it's not working with infrared light, it's working with radio waves. And it only works when something's under a strong magnet. So if you've ever, has anyone ever had an MRI scan done on them? A few of you, okay. So you're put in a big magnet, uh, otherwise you're uh, MRI invisible. Uh, so they magnetize you and all of your nuclei so that they can actually see uh, what's there. Different nuclei will absorb for different frequencies, so carbon absorbs differently than hydrogen, which absorbs differently than fluorine, and so on. NMR takes advantage of the fact that, that nuclei, protons, which are in the center of every nucleus, spin around like tops. And because they have a charge, a positive charge, when you have a spinning charge, that creates a magnetic field. So some of them will be spinning up, or clockwise, others will be spinning counterclockwise, so by convention we have, they have a spinning up or a spin down. So that spinning creates one where the north pole is up, or other cases the north pole is down. So again, just a random collection of nuclei or protons from a random substance will have a bunch with uh, up spins and down spins. 
when they're under a strong magnetic field, you have a Boltzmann distribution of up and down spins, but if you send in a radio wave, it'll cause some of these nuclei to change their orientation in the spin. They'll flip up. So hit something with energy, just like when you warm something up, adds energy, so these spins flip up. And that, uh, that incident radiation is, is the way that we measure the absorption, and then when you turn it off, they relax, and some of the spins flip back. As that flipping back happens, we're able to detect radio frequencies that have been absorbed. So you can increase the magnetic strength, and in fact, uh, the stronger magnets actually give you better NMR spectra. Uh, they go from lower frequency to higher frequencies, and we really like high frequencies. Really, really big magnets help a lot. So in a modern NMR instrument, you'll take in a sample, you'll inject it into a magnet, you'll bombard the sample with radio waves, and then eventually detect these signals. The magnets themselves are about the size of a refrigerator. Uh, they are superconducting magnets. They're giant thermoses wrapped around with a liquid helium bath to keep things super cool, with another bath of liquid nitrogen surrounded by space blankets and metal containers. So a typical NMR magnet is about half a million dollars, um, and they're maintained regularly by filling up with uh, liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. And at the core of this giant container is a magnet maybe about the size of a toaster, uh, wrapped with a tin niobium wire. Um, and this is sort of the cross-section where you can see the collections of vacuum, liquid helium, liquid nitrogen, just to keep things <laughs> ultra cool. Um, but then this, this superconducting magnet at the center of it. Um, in the superconducting magnet, yes? Uh, it's about uh, 4 Kelvin, so very cold. Um, but the probe, which is where your sample sits, is at room temperature. So the magnet is 4 Kelvin, but the sample inside, just like if you had an MRI, you're not chilled to um, 4 degrees Kelvin, but uh, it's room temperature. Um, so this is where the electronics... It does, although all the ones that they're using now are, are just this Tim. They, they haven't used the new ceramic superconductors, so they're just using tin and niobium. So it, it's, uh, unfortunately, uh, they haven't been able to figure out to get the, the necessary uh, flux. Yeah. But inside the magnet, you have a little probe, and this is where there's all the radio receiver transmitter stuff. That probe is at room temperature. And in that probe is a little wire called a saddle coil, which is where your sample actually sits. So the probe goes up at the bottom of the magnet, and then there's this bore, which is about uh, 10 millimeters across, um, maybe sometimes up to 50 millimeters across, depending on the sample. So this is, that's an NMR tube, so a very thin pencil-sized um, tube that's dropped into this coil. And the coil is an antenna. It's a radio antenna. And it allows you to transmit radio signals and to detect radio signals. So it's like the optics in a UV spec, except it's not light, it's radio waves. So that's kind of the meat or the core if you want. So you've just got this massive thing just to try and give you a magnetic field. But the essence of, 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 of the NMR is this coil here. So what you'll get is a Looks like a chromatogram again. A um, bunch of peaks. In this case, instead of measuring time, we're measuring chemical shifts. And these are frequencies uh, marked in parts per million. We'll see certain splitting patterns. We'll see things with different intensities. The chemical shifts are the things that tell you what you're looking at. Different hydrogen atoms have different chemical shifts depending on their chemistry, the bonding. And every molecule, or just about every molecule, has a unique set of fingerprints or chemical shifts. So NMR, even today, is the standard method for determining the structure of small molecules. It, it always beats mass spec, always will beat mass spec, because it provides you this detailed information about uh, neighboring atoms, chemical bonds, chemical structure.
Most NMR spectroscopists memorize these kinds of tables. So they know which chemical shifts correspond to which groups, and so they can often just look at a single uh, NMR spectrum and figure out whether this is a methyl group, methylene group, um, whether it's located to a strongly electronegative atom, uh, telling you how many protons there are. Uh, again, it's practice, but it is even something that can be computerized where people can look at, at spectra and assign them. And there are characteristic chemical shifts around 7 or 8 ppm where you're looking at aromatic groups, methylene and methyl groups, the numbers of peaks telling you how many protons are there, the intensity, and so on. NMR spectra don't give you clean results, so when you first collect the, the NMR spectrum, they're really messy. The peaks are kind of all over the place. They're warped. This is called, they're out of phase. And so humans actually have to do a lot of that fixing. So they don't give you a nice clean chromatograms of HPLC or GC. Um, they kind of mess up with, with this. So we'll learn about this later on for your, your lab. And so this just sort of describes the fixing that we typically have to do to, to clean up a spectrum so it's presentable and usable. And it, it's a, a manual process, it always has been. Um, hopefully in the next few years it will become fully automatic. So again, if you look at each of the things I've seen or shown you guys, liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, uh, MS, NMR, they all have this characteristic. Lots of sharp peaks spread out in some cases over time, in this case over frequency, and in all cases intensities vary and we're usually using that to identify what these compounds are. The reason why I've talked about these different methods is that each of them is useful for different types of situations. Some are useful at measuring higher abundance molecules, more polar molecules. NMR is very good at that. Others are, are best looking at, at low abundance molecules. Um, Someone might say, based on the sensitivity of these systems, why don't we just always do LCMS? That's partly the reason why a lot of metabolomics is done with LCMS. The problem is that 90% of what you're seeing with LCMS, we don't know what it is. Whereas with NMR, 90% of what you're seeing, you do know what it is. And so when you're working with knowns, it's obviously easier to write a paper <laughs> or to come up with a pathway or describe a phenomenon. Um, and so that's one reason why NMR still continues to be popular, even though it's not very sensitive. The other thing is that each of the techniques specializes in different compounds. So to get a full picture, you often have to use all three or four different techniques. This is just a comparison. I'm not going to take the time to read through it, so you guys can look at it during the coffee break. But this just highlights the different volume requirements, the types of metabolites, the numbers of samples that could be done, processed, the limits of detection, the numbers of metabolites that people might see in a given sample, and then the overlap. And the important point here is that overlapping metabolites, these are complementary methods. They're not duplicating methods. So it's worthwhile doing at least two and usually three different methods. NMR can give you up to 200 compounds that you can identify and quantify. GCMS can also match that in some cases. You can use flow injection mass spec or liquid chromatography mass spec. You can generally identify um, more with uh, DIMS and LCMS, although it's hard to quantify them. Lipid methods now, because there's so many different lipids and they all are very similar in structure, you can actually get several thousand identified. The last part is that we're talking about identification and then something we call chemometric methods. There's targeted and untargeted metabolomics. We're going to largely focus on targeted metabolomics here, uh, and that's where the whole field is moving. Uh, it's trying to identify and quantify everything that they can see, or as much as possible. The older methods of metabolomics were saying, we're looking for pattern differences. Is this pattern different than that pattern? And if you see pattern differences, that's good. And then you have to go back and do quantitative metabolomics, uh, which can take just as long as if you started with quantitative metabolomics to begin with. So that's why the chemometric or non-targeted methods are sort of being replaced. 
This is a flow for uh, untargeted metabolomics. You collect lots and lots of samples, look at things as, as though they're patterns or clouds, see which clouds are more similar, and then you go off and uh, separate them using different methods, which we'll talk about tomorrow, and then eventually identify. The quantitative approach is to identify first, quantify roughly at the same time, then use the data analysis. So it actually saves you a step. And then you can go right into the biological interpretation. So what we're trying to do, and what we'll do over today, is to go from spectra to lists of compounds, both their identity and hopefully their quantity. And then what we'll do tomorrow is go from those lists to their pathways, which is the biological interpretation. And then at the very end we'll show how you can go from those pathways and lists to things like models and biomarkers, things that are you know, important these days. So all of these are things that we're going to focus on for the next uh, uh, day or day and a half, and uh, we'll try and talk about each of these specific topics uh, in each of the next sets of lectures. Okay, it's coffee time. Let's come back.